Hello Revolution students and welcome back to another video on the Russian Revolution area of study one. In this video I'm going to look at how Tsar Nicholas II contributed to the February 1917 revolution. One of the biggest things he did was to break a promise. And if you remember back to the 1905 revolution and how he issued the October Manifesto and in the October Manifesto he made the promise to create a legislative assembly, a legislative parliament, a legislative Duma. When the first Duma actually sat at the start of April 1906, the Tsar reissued a document called the Fundamental Laws. And in that document, he stated that the sovereign emperor possesses the initiative in all legislative matters. The sovereign emperor ratifies the laws no law can come into force without his approval. So the fundamental laws broke that promise that was made in the October Manifesto to create a legislative Duma. This made the deputies within the Dumas very, very angry and contributed to the constant criticisms that they had of the Tsar and his regime. These criticisms themselves also contributed to an increase in social tension and a drop in the popularity of the Tsar amongst the people. There is an Okhrana report uh, from 1913 which refers to uh, the people uh, uh, talking about these criticisms of the Duma towards the Tsar and his ministers and agreeing with those criticisms. So uh, what the uh, Dumas were saying about the Tsar uh, and the Duma deputies were saying about the Tsar in their sessions and their criticisms of the Tsar uh, were having a huge effect within Russia. Another contributing factor was when the Tsar appointed himself Commander-in-Chief of Russia's Armed Forces on the 22nd of August 1915. And you can see there it tied uh, the Tsar's fate to that of Russia's performance in the war and the Tsar himself became personally responsible if he had appointed another general as commander-in-chief and uh, the Russians had been defeated, then he could blame the general for that defeat. However, he appointed himself, so he was now responsible for both victories and defeats. And unfortunately for the Russian military, they were defeated a number of times by the Germans. And as we can see there, as a consequence, as Russia's defeats mounted, the Tsar lost credibility as the leader of the empire and his popularity suffered. Another consequence of the Tsar's actions and how they contributed to the February 1917 revolution was his refusal to work with the Progressive Bloc. And the Progressive Bloc was an alliance of deputies of all persuasions in the Duma, a majority of the deputies, and they formed this Progressive Bloc in order in their eyes to save uh, the Tsar system uh, during the war. The fact that the Tsar refused to work with it only led these deputies to criticise the Tsar and his ministers even further. So these criticisms were heard on the streets of St Petersburg and Moscow and contributed to a greater social tension, greater anger amongst the people towards Tsarist rule. And the final and most significant act of the Tsar was related to that second point there. So when he uh, assigned himself as Commander-in-Chief of Russia's Armed Forces on the 22nd of August 1915, he had to go to the front for uh, long periods of time. And while he was at the front commanding the soldiers, he left his wife, the Tsarina, and Rasputin in control of the civilian government. Rasputin uh, was known as the Mad Monk and people throughout Russia of all persuasions, whether they be um, peasants, whether they be the aristocracy or so forth, they did not like Rasputin because of the great control he had over both the Tsar and the Tsarina. And you can have a look at that cartoon there. That depicts how many Russians viewed this relationship. They saw Rasputin as an evil man, a mad monk, and that he had the Tsar and Tsarina under total control. Uh, the Tsarina herself was also disliked 
by many people in Russia because she was German and she was seen as, or she was called a German woman. And many people believed that she was actually a German spy and um, giving important military secrets to the Kaiser to help the Kaiser defeat the Russian military. These two individuals, the Tsarina and Rasputin, had uh, control over the civilian government for long periods of time during 1915 and 1916 and they appointed uh, ministers as they wanted to. They appointed ministers who supported them and they, this, was called, this process was called ministerial leapfrogging and it resulted, for example, in four prime ministers between 1915 and 1916. This constant changing of ministers, this instability within the government further eroded the Tsar's credibility as a leader and lost him uh, the support of the people and in particular the aristocracy. And when the aristocracy no longer supported the Tsar and his rule, uh, then pretty much he had no support whatsoever and it was a major reason why he decided to abdicate in late February 1917. So that's a summary of the key points in relation to how the Tsar contributed to the February 1917 revolution. Let's now have a look at a couple of historical interpretations. So the first one here is from Trotsky. And he wrote, Nicholas II inherited from his ancestors not only a giant empire, but also a revolution. That's a very, very nice uh, sentence there. And they did not bequeath him one quality which would have made him capable of governing an empire or even a province or a county. So this is in relation to the February 1917 revolution, but you could also apply it to the 1905 revolution as well, um, that uh, the Tsar had inherited that revolution. The second historical interpretation is from Richard Pipes, and he writes, an autocracy required an autocrat, an autocrat not only in terms of formal prerogatives, but also by virtue of personality. As genetic accident would have it, however, on the eve of the 20th century, Russia had the worst of both worlds. A Tsar who lacked the intelligence and character to rule, yet insisted on playing the autocrat. So both Richard Pipes and Trotsky are very, very critical of the Tsar, and they blame him for the February 1917 revolution, rather than the aristocratic class or uh, fundamental uh, problems within Russian society itself. So anyway, there is my summary of the Tsar's contribution to the February 1917 revolution. I hope you have found it useful for your study of the Russian Revolution area of study one, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.